This is Mercedes' vision of the future. It's an all-electric flagship sedan. It's called the EQS. We're going to check out all the features and then we're going to take it for a drive. Right now on Driving Sports TV. Based on a new, unique electric architecture, the EQS 584 Matic is the first in a new line of electric vehicles from Mercedes EQ. The heart of the EQS is an electrified powertrain that includes dual electric motors with 385 kilowatts of output each and a lithium-ion battery pack that gives a range of up to 340 miles. Quick charge to 80% with a DC quick charge station in as little as 30 minutes for those extended road trips. The model we're looking at today features a number of upgrades for a retail price of $126,645 US dollars, including destination. Because there's no engine in the EQS, it's just a pair of electric motors, the hood doesn't open. So to get to your wiper fluid, they have a little slot right here. And I'm not really sure how to open it, but it's right here, that's what this is for. Man, these wheels are huge. They are 21 inches and they are wrapped in Blizzak snow tires. Now, will we find snow today? I don't know, it's kind of late in the season, but if we do, we got the tires for it. The back can open either with a remote closes to or you can use your foot. As a coupe styled sedan, the rear hatch reveals a very large and useful storage area. Under the floor is a charger in its own carry case. You can either close or close and lock. The second row is just airy. I mean, it's a combination of this really light material, this big panorama sunroof. It's actually really nice looking. However, there are some issues. First off, I'm sitting here and my head is hitting this roof. On a vehicle this big, that should not be happening. I do like the wood material here and this, you know, Burmeister speaker is gorgeous. But what else do I have going on back here? I mean, there's no way to adjust these seats. There is an armrest with just a device holder, no cup holder. I don't see any cup holders. There's got to be a cup holder. No, that's a dual USB-C socket. Huh. So in recreating and re-envisioning a luxury sedan, Mercedes apparently thought that, hey, nobody wants beverages anymore, ever, or places to put things. Huh. So weird. Okay, well, maybe it's better up front. I'm sure there's at least a cup holder up there. If I locked the vehicle and walked away for a while and then came back, when I returned, the door handles would deploy. They would pop out. However, since I've stayed close to the vehicle, I have to manually do an override, which is a hidden button, right? Where is it? It's here somewhere. Um, there we go. Got it. Okay, let's check this out. So I could start it up with fingerprint recognition, but I have my key with me, so I'm not going to do that right now. And my first thought here is, wow, that's a lot of screens. But my second thought is, what an odd mix of 1960s speedboat and bridge of the Starship Enterprise from the next generation. I mean, the swoopiness, the lights, the screens. There's a lot going on here. And I'm not sure I entirely like it. First off, not a fan of light interiors. Obvious reasons. How do you keep this clean? I mean, even if you are pristine with your hands, unless you're wearing driving gloves every day, you're going to get this steering wheel all mucked up. And then there's these screens. So many screens to keep clean and not scratch. 
They are slightly concave too, which helps with reflections. I actually haven't had any issues with reflections with these, but I have been filming this in the Pacific Northwest where it has been overcast. Okay, we got a couple USB-C sockets there. So in the creation of this EQS 580, Mercedes has tried to rethink what a car is to people. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. This just looks ridiculous. This is too much. Unless this car has 100% autopilot, I just don't need this many screens. I just don't. I don't even know what to do with them. And I was raised with computers and typically I think I like screens, but I'm looking at this and I'm like, no, that's too many. <laughs> Um, but let's try to make sense of this best we can. Uh, let's start with the essentials, the seat. It's a little on the firm side, but the leather is nice and it is sculpted to my body. I have heating and cooling, as well as three stages of memory. And they did change their little rocker setup, so Mercedes always puts the adjustments on the door here in a seat-shaped series of switches, but normally where you slide them, these ones are like touch-sensitive. So you're not really sure, are you just at the end of your movement cycle or is it not working? So like, for example, I'm pushing down, I'm pushing down, but nothing's happening. Like, do I need to push harder? Oh, no, it's, it's working. It's just doesn't give me any input. Again, change for change's sake does not always yield a better product. I think that's the case with this. The movement switches, you know you've engaged the switch. This one, you're like, did I engage something? I don't know. Is it doing anything? I don't know. Let's wait and see. Um, yeah, that's kind of annoying. The door pull, something as simple as a door pull. You look at the door here and you're like, I have no idea where to pull on that because there's no indication of where the pull is. It's kind of visually hidden behind this sculpted wood. Again, why not show me where the door pull is? Why does this have to be complicated? It is masterfully crafted, though. I gotta say, like, the stitching here, this this um, ultra suede, the lights, the layers, the materials. By all measurements of skill, this is a masterfully crafted interior. But it doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that to be a Luddite. I mean, it's... I, I like screens. I like inputs. I like lots of things. But I, I just don't see the advantage of this. And this isn't a self-driving car. It doesn't even have uh, the basic premise of a self-driving car. Um, so again, these screens, what am I supposed to do with all these? Now let's talk about the gauge cluster. The gauge cluster is a little bit more traditional modern Mercedes. You can flick through this with this touch sensitive controller here and flick through a number of different settings. Everything from an eco display to a range monitor, which by the way, this has over 300 miles of range, which is a nice sweet spot for an electric car tells me, you know, if I'm getting tired. Uh, I can also put a map up here. Although, since the entire center dash is map, I'm not sure why I would ever need that up here. And then on the right side, you have a power meter, and on the left side, you have a speedo. Other than safety stuff, such as adaptive cruise control, there's really not much else to do here. The steering wheel, which is how you control it, does use a variety of these little touch sensitive things. The one on the left handles the main uh, gauge cluster. The one on the right handles the large display over there. Um, I actually preferred the older style of inserts. They used to have these ones that had like different textures and I just think that worked better. This one, um, it seems like it's it just feels cheaper. It doesn't feel better. Uh, now you do have paddles in the back here. They are not for shifting because of course electric cars do not have gears not in the traditional sense. And so these actually just adjust the levels of regen braking and similar to what we saw in the Subaru Solterra review that I just did recently. On the left is wiper control. On the right, because this is a Mercedes, you have your transmission lever. An interesting thing, if I go into reverse, it opens up that little Mercedes logo in the back and it shows me both a surround view with kind of a really cool interactive um, sonars uh, as well as a really pretty rear view camera. Now, this is a very, very forward looking camera setup in that it has full surround view. When I come up to stoplights, it'll go to the front view, uh, which is that one. They've also implemented augmented reality, tying the nav system to the front camera, and that's really cool. I'll show you that a little bit later. 
that's our introduction to the middle screen. And the middle screen is kind of where you control everything here. And they've, you know, they have this massive map, which does show you where all the charging stations are, which is nice. Uh, it also gives you quick access to the EQ settings, uh, which I'm not sure why, wait, see, that's, it says EQ, I click it and now it's navigation. But if I click EQ down here, it gives me a different thing, which shows me my battery level. Interface 101, don't make the same things mean different things. They failed there. Uh, it does use natural voice search, and it actually is really good in this car. I can just say, hey, Mercedes, navigate to the nearest charger. Please select from the following location. Okay, and we get a list of available chargers. Closest one is 1.8 miles away. Uh, unfortunately, this list does not tell me if it's a DC fast charge. Oh, it does. It says fast charging station. I'm assuming that's for DC fast charge. Hey, uh, Mercedes, how old is Britney Spears? See, the thing with voice triggers, they need to work every time. This one doesn't. Hey, uh, Mercedes. How can I help? How old is Britney Spears? Britney Spears is 40 years old. She's still 40 years old. So it'll also do freestyle text data. It'll pull data from the web. So uh, the, the one issue that I do have with any of these, hey, whatever systems, you know, where you use the, the name of the car maker, which I'm not gonna mention right now, uh, to activate the voice control is if you ever talk about cars, which I kind of do, you're constantly triggering it. So it can be a little bit of a challenge if talking cars is your thing, because it's going to constantly wake up. Now I can disable that in the system somewhere, uh, who knows where, but all these systems, you can you can always disable that if you, if you really don't like it. Uh, and then I can just use the button up here to trigger the voice commands. Uh, the voice commands can also be used to modify the cabin as I like. Hey, Mercedes, how may I help you? Set my temperature to 70 degrees. I'm setting the temperature to 70 degrees. Hey Mercedes, turn on my massage unit. I'm switching on the massage for you. And now my activating massage has been triggered. So you can do most functions using the voice command. Um, the Hey Mercedes trigger doesn't always seem to work. Uh, and all, but you can always go to the voice command uh, button up here if you need to. Now, speaking of the massage units, we have all sorts of different settings and it's good for both the driver and passenger at this trim level. I'm just gonna leave that running while I'm talking because it feels really nice. Uh, you hit the home button, you get the main options. These will be very familiar if you've driven another Mercedes, at least a modern one. We have the same apps, comfort, settings, phone, radio, media, info, and EQ. Here, EQ does go to the battery settings. Then we go back here, and then we can also flick over for smartphone interface. Uh, let's just kind of bop up backwards on these. So you can see this actually is a really good example of how this system is laid out. Electric motor, electric motor, and battery packs in the middle. Um, under vehicle, we can see how things are progressing as I'm driving. This would give me live data as I'm driving if I need it. And then media we can use this to connect via Bluetooth. We can also do online music using a variety of services or USB. Radio, that's where XM uh, as well as terrestrial is put in and it's a nice interface, flicky style one, which is consistent with other Mercedes vehicles. Moving on through the things, we have phone integration, uh, settings, which this helps me set up the vehicle. It's a nice tabbed format with some good graphics up there. This is where we can look at all of the advanced safety stuff, including driving, like active driving assist, lane change assist, collision avoidance systems. It has traffic sign assist, cameras, which you can um, modify there. And then of course, parking assist as well. Moving over, we have vehicle. We can turn on sounds, yes or no. We have a creep function, which I like the creep function because it makes it feel like a traditional automatic transmission where when you're stopped, but your foot's not on the brake, it'll creep forward. You can turn that off if you prefer more of a, you know, foot off the throttle and the car is completely stopped. Convenience, uh, you, you know, this is for adjusting personal preferences, open, closed, uh, and then dynamics. So every time you get in the vehicle, you can make it request what kind of dynamic settings you want. Let's go ahead and turn that on because I think that's kind of neat. 
Because every time you drive, you might feel like a different kind of, uh, you know, experience. Dynamics can also be controlled uh, quicker over here with a physical push button, uh, so you can toggle through the settings. You can see that for individual, there's a number of settings. You can modify the drive uh, between Sport, Comfort, and Eco. The suspension is adjustable because it's an air suspension. Steering, uh, tighter or a little bit more relaxed. Uh, traction control. And then sound. If you want to pipe in fake sound that's more aggressive, you can be sport or uh, a little bit more angelic, you can do comfort. The lighting systems, these are dynamic lights throughout the cabin and they are, actually I think one of the cooler aspects of this vehicle is their use of light, but you can change exactly what kind of a color format you want. Um, so like say interior lighting, oh let's not do delay, let's say digital light, ambient light, kind of settings, there we go, that's where I can actually adjust to different color schemes. It can respond to your energy use or it can just respond to other cabin uh, inputs. Go back here and then we have comfort. Now in comfort also ambient lighting is buried uh, but this is also where you adjust the seats and the massage units. And then below that we do have a climate menu which you just click on climate below that and then you get all the settings up here. There are user profiles you can have settings for your user profile if you like. We are currently set up just on a standard guest account, so I didn't bother to adjust mine. And this can be synchronized to the cloud with other Mercedes that you happen to own. Okay, that's a basic tour here. Hey Mercedes, go find me some coffee. Here are several coffee shops. Where do you want to go? Five Stones Coffee, Urban Coffee Lounge. You, you will note it's only finding me things that actually have coffee in the title. Except that one doesn't, although it does say espresso, so they might have have a simile uh, built into the search tool. Anyway, right, so that actually works pretty good, I think, all things considered. One more thing to go over here, and that's device connection. So I, of course, do have an iPhone. This is an iPhone 11 Pro, I think. Um, and what we can do is we can actually use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to connect the device wirelessly. Uh, to get started, basically, I go to Bluetooth sees my phone immediately. Should connect, pair, allow, use CarPlay. I do not have the uh, app except and start that. Oh, by app, I don't have the uh, Mercedes Inbox app. I do believe that is the quickest, easiest setup I've ever had for a wireless mobile device did not even have to go through the prompts really i just basically said yes to everything and boom i'm here within like a few seconds did not need a cable at all and then at this point i can now use apple carplay as my primary interface although given the technology in this vehicle i don't think you really need apple carplay it's just kind of like a different system i don't think it's necessarily a better system unless of course you want to use the apps that are um, on your device because obviously there's no equivalent of on x for the mbox head unit <laughs> but you're not going to take this thing off-roading anyway so maybe that's a silly uh example um let's just say okay well podcasts if you want to use podcasts you can use the podcast app here and there we go there's also an interface over here now i'm going to move from the driver's side to the passenger side so we can discuss that So right here we have a passenger screen essentially we powered on. Now you can't use the guest profile because the guest profile is being used by the driver. Um, I can however use without a user profile if I like. And from here I can actually do all sorts of things. So I have my own little map interface here to show you that I can use multiple maps. There's a big one there for the driver and a smaller one here. I can use my own keyboard here to find my own items. Let's say I don't want to go to an independent coffee house, I want to go to Starbucks. I can say OK, go to that one, let's go, and then it throws that navigation over to the main screen for the driver. It's basically the exact same thing as what the driver gets, so I can actually pair my own phone over here. The system will support two mobile devices. Radio, I can pick my own radio station and don't have to mess with the driver, say I want to go to Outlaw Country, there we go. And I can also integrate my own media devices. Use my own apps. So I can, for example, look at the weather. Chance of rain, because of course, Seattle. 
there's some more here though. Look at apps. Yeah, I got Tetris right here. I think this is actually just one of those things where you're like, gee whiz, that's cool. But in real everyday use, it's just not going to be used. It's just good enough for entertainment's sake. And it, it, you just don't need your passenger to do all your stuff for the driver. It's just, it's just not a common use scenario. So I think it almost is like, what can we do? Not should we do it? Because nobody needs that really. It's the same. I mean, I feel the same way about entertainment in the second row at this point. People are just going to have their own iPads. Like, why, why do you need to have something that's built into the car you're paying a lot of money for, uh, but doesn't actually give you any uh, anything actually, you know, better? Now, you can share content between devices here and all that, but, you know, whatever. Uh, I just don't see that really being a thing. And back in the driver's seat. Um, the one thing I didn't quite go over is this control interface here. And I... I yeah. I have a problem with it. The problem is, first off, you have your start stop here, which is fine. You're not gonna accidentally hit that because it's in set. And also it doesn't matter if you do accidentally hit it, it's not gonna shut the car down uh, while you're driving. You have a fingerprint recognition thing there. Let's go ahead and configure that. Oh, I don't actually have a pin because Mercedes set this profile up for me. So let's just go ahead and cancel that. If I did have my pin with me, I could use this for fingerprint recognition and then I can start the car with just a fingerprint, which is cool. Some of the other Mercedes vehicles do that as well. It is not exclusive to the EQS. So over here, we do have start stop. We have the volume up down. You also have a screen power. If you want to shut everything off, you can do that here. Over here, we have vehicle functions. And this lets me kind of modify like the ESP system, how on or off it is, whether or not I'm running in snow chains because it needs to modify the uh, vehicle powertrain to deal with that. Uh, the Parktronic sensors, lane keep assist. I like the animations there, those are cool. The active steering assist, interior protection motion sensor, and then tow alarm. And there's actually some more settings if I dip into that and go back into that panel that I showed you earlier. Uh, and here I can also spin the vehicle if I want to navigate based on which systems are tied into which thing. So that's another way to deal with that. And then there's the EQ button, which gives me my range, level of consumption, all that kind of stuff. And then you have your dynamics control. These are shortcuts to the different drive modes, which will make the vehicle either more conservative or more aggressive, depending on your personal driving style. And we can configure the drive modes to prompt me whenever I get into the car so I can pick you know, what kind of mood I'm in that day. And then individual allows me to modify all the settings, which just jumps me to the dynamic select menu. And here I can modify individual for my own personal taste. I do find it amusing that they use an engine to represent setting up the powertrain uh, when there's no actual engine, it's two electric motors, but I guess, you know, they have the clip art available. <laughs> I don't know. There's also a parking view. I have a door open for this camera, so you can't, so there's a big black hole there, but I can flick around so I can actually see what is live outside the vehicle. I mean, that is actually based on a live signal. It flattened out my coffee cup though, which is sitting by the back door. The biggest problem I have here is open up this port, rest your arm there, and it's not that hard to accidentally trigger your hazard lights. It is so easy to do that. I have done that multiple times. I'm driving along and I'm like, why are my hazards on? Oh, I hit this because I was like reaching for my phone because it had fallen back here or something. And that is a very deep, there is a charging, a wireless charging pad in here uh, and you got to go pretty deep there. And so it's super easy. See, I just turned it off, just trying to put my phone in there. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's not like you're trying to do it, but why do you put the hazard there? Put it someplace where you're not going to hit it all the time. In fact, all of these, it's just, the way they've structured this, it just doesn't, it's, it's, I just, I just don't like it. I don't like the location of it. Uh, now this bin is useful and I do like it when they have a large useful bin where you have your two USB-C sockets, you have cup holders and you have a charging pad for a mobile device. That is all good. And then you can kind of hide it all away. And then below that, there's actually more storage too. If you uh, need to put anything, you know, like a hat or something, you can put that down there. And then further, you have more storage back here with two more USB-C sockets. So you got lots of sockets, lots of bins, a lot of useful space. Ultimately though, this vehicle does only have the two cup holders. 
that's it. Which, in 2022, it's not like you need 100 cup holders, but come on. I think you need more than two. <laughs> a Miata has more cup holders than this big thing, which is a little silly. So ergonomically, there is an issue here. The seats are comfortable. However, to put this wheel where I want it down here blocks the gauge cluster. What is it with electric car makers where they won't let me put the wheel where I want it to be? The Toyota BZ4X Subaru Solterra combo also has the same problem. But where the Solterra slash BZ4X has me put the wheel really low so I can look over the wheel to the gauge cluster, this one I think is even worse because it makes me put the wheel that high. I never have the wheel that high. That's ridiculous. And if the wheel is not in this position while I'm driving, it'll actually prompt me to raise the wheel up because it wants to make sure that I can see the entire gauge cluster. That's annoying. That is really annoying. <sighs> Just why do electric car makers have to constantly break things? Like, I want the wheel here. I want the gauge cluster here. I don't want... I don't want to, like, why, why is the wheel at eye level? That makes no sense. I guess maybe if I'm like, no, but I don't actually have a ton of extra headroom here. I mean, if I close this, which is a flick, yeah, some of this is you have to click and some of it is just gesture. I, I'm not quite sure what makes the difference there. But with this closed, um, my head is really close to the ceiling here as it is, so I can't really raise my seat up that much. So I have to kind of keep it here. So yeah, I, I have to have the wheel up super high. Do not like that. So already, off the bat, I don't like this car. I just don't. I'm, which is weird because I really like some of the Mercedes vehicles. Like, uh, especially the AMGs, the GLE AMG, um, the C63. These are all uh, Mercedes. They got their ergonomics. They nailed it. And then they said, eh, we're building a new car. Let's, let's, not, let's not take any of the stuff we've learned. Let's just, let's just do something new for no particular reason. Why is the wheel this high? Uh, well, maybe it won't affect my driving. Maybe. Anyway, let's take it for a drive and see how the EQS does. to the on-ramp and floor it! Okay, that's got a little kick. Oh. <laughs> so today we are gonna go on a little bit of a road trip. We're gonna go over Snoqualmie Pass to a town called Cleellum. There we're gonna turn around and drive back. And even though this vehicle has over 300 miles of range, I do not have it completely full because I figure most people aren't gonna top all the way up before they do a road trip. So I was looking in Cleellum and it is 80 miles from our office. And with 300 miles range, 80 plus 80 should equal, you know, that's 160. We should have more than enough range for this outing. We are, however, going up mountains. There should be snow up at the pass. I'm not too concerned about that because we are equipped with Blizzak snow tires right now. So we might get a little bit more cabin noise. And speaking of that, on the freeway, I'm actually getting very little road noise here. In fact, the EQS does a really good job of insulating the driver from the environment. Perhaps a little too good because this steering is fully numb. I cannot feel what's going on with this car. Uh, <laughs> it's quiet though, and it is comfortable. So it has those two things going for it. So in terms of like autonomous driving or anything else future forward, this really doesn't have it. It does, however, have a lane detect system uh, with lane tracing. So as we can see with my hands off, we're steering around the corner. It's doing a good job. And if I put the blinker on, it'll even lane change for me once it detects that it's safe. So that's pretty solid. However, after, you know, 10, 15 seconds, it does tell me to put my hands back on the wheel. It wants to make sure that I know that this is not a fully autonomous system. Power is so good in this thing, even when you're cruising at 60 miles an hour, just punch it and 
Yeah, you feel that. <laughs> it's perhaps the best thing about electric cars. But before we continue our adventure over this mountain, we're gonna pop off the freeway to a little bit of a windy road to just kind of see how well this thing handles. So the weather is turning south on us very quickly. It is raining. Uh, visibility is still pretty good. Actually, in terms of visibility, overall, this thing I give it kind of a mediocre. This A pillar is massive. That C pillar is really hard to see out of as well. But luckily, this thing does have a full 360 camera system, so that does help you in parking lots. Once on the side road, we can kind of play with the different dynamic settings. Right now I'm in comfort and yeah, it is smooth and quiet. Power delivery, of course, is what you would expect in an electric car. If you punch it, you get a lot of torque and everything else is just kind of, you know, mild. Now we're gonna go ahead and switch into the dynamic mode of sport, which amps up electric motors, air suspension, steering feel, traction control, and sound effects because yeah, you need sound effects in these things because they don't really make any noise themselves. Let's see what this thing can do with a zero to 60. I expect good things. I mean this, oh, turning radius, excellent because this actually has four wheel steering. It'll tilt the back wheels in 10 degrees. Turns on a dime. Let's go ahead and pull up. Let's put it into dynamic mode sport so we have maximum output. Three, two, one, go. Mother of and 60. <laughs> wow. That is, um, that's quick. Now, fast zero to 60 times are a hallmark of, you know, high end electric cars because those electric motors just can put a ton of torque out. However, once the road gets twisty, that's where things get challenging because most of them are super numb, don't feel particularly good on twisty roads. However, this Mercedes, yeah, it's exactly like all the other electric cars. It's completely numb on twisty roads and I can't feel anything. I have no emotion driving this car. Zero to 60 is great. Everything else, totally boring. Okay, now that we've had a little fun, we're gonna jump onto the freeway and continue our adventure to Clee Ellum, Washington. Freeway on ramp! I think this is a great opportunity to try out the uh, built-in voice system. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Hey, Mercedes. How may I help you? Navigate to Clee Allen, Washington. Here is what I found. Where do you want to go? Number one. I will show you the way. Please show me the way. Okay, there we go. So it is okay. telling. Okay, so it is telling me uh, that we have 44 miles remaining on this leg of the trip. Uh, the total trip is actually 80 miles. Before we took that exit, we'd already driven some. It says when we arrive, we'll have a 50% charge on the vehicle. If I was concerned about getting back, I could click on this, and then I could find charging stations. And I don't want to find them all. Hey, let's, let's look along the route. What do we got for options here? Back in North Bend, uh, which is a town we just passed probably about 15 minutes ago, there is actually a bank of 350 uh, and 100 watt DC fast chargers. So there are along the route here, just not on this particular leg. But it's okay because we have a vehicle with 300 miles of range. So it should be fine, I hope. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the seat warmers turn on the seat massager, activating massage, driver, and I'm just gonna enjoy the rest of this trip. If there is an opportunity to pull off for a little snow fun, I will do that. Uh, but for right now, let's just uh, see how this trip goes. I'm also gonna set the adaptive cruise control. Turn it on, set, pace up, set my pace, there we go. While I'm kicking back on this long drive, there's a couple things that I wanna talk about with this EQS that I absolutely do not like. You might have noticed that there is a screen in the passenger side of the vehicle, and in that screen, you can play a number of games. You can look up things, you can, you know, do stuff. However, many of those things, specifically the games, are all deactivated when the vehicle is in drive. 
Like, what's the point of having apps and a separate screen for the passenger if even the passenger can't access that while you're driving? That makes no sense. That tells me they never actually put somebody on this seat and tested it in the real world. It's just frustrating, little things like that. Also, in terms of charging, before I went on this trip, I did top off up to 80% and I went to a charging station and there at that particular station, there are two 350 uh, kilowatt chargers and two 100s. Well, I've had problems in the past with one of those chargers, so I wasn't gonna use it. So I jumped over to the one that I've had success with. It was out of order. So I jumped back to the one that I haven't had success with and it didn't work still. So then I had to jump to a 100 watt charger and it only output 54 kilowatts. It's like, why is this so difficult? Have a charging station that works, please. If people are actually doing long trips in these vehicles, they need to know that the charging stations are gonna work when you get there. Because if they're not, you got issues. Like Sirius might be spending the night in the middle of nowhere issues. So those things need to get fixed. Now, those are not necessarily, well, the screen issue is a Mercedes issue, but malfunctioning charging stations, I can't really blame Mercedes, but on the other hand, every car maker is responsible because they are making vehicles that rely on these stations. And if they don't get their hands involved, and if they don't actually make sure these stations are reliable and there when people need them, then it's gonna hurt all the EV manufacturers. And that is one area where Tesla is absolutely winning. And I just haven't seen anybody else step up. It's all these partnerships like, oh, you know, Volkswagen partnered with this company and Ford partnered with this company. You know what? You need to stop doing that. You need to get your hands dirty and you need to do the work and you need to get EV stations to be 100% operable all the time. Okay, done with my soapbox. Let's travel over the pass. Now we pulled off the freeway and we are driving on a snow covered road and this is perfect it's fresh snow so we're going to see how this all-wheel drive system responds we don't have anything too challenging here we're just going to drive up and down this road kind of feel it out now of course ice will be ice and it's going to slip a bit but we do have blizzax on and we have all-wheel drive so let's pull aside i'm going to let nick out so we can do some filming here and we're going to see how this thing responds okay let's put the power down it's a little slippery, not too bad. Oh. <laughs> yeah, let's try a zero to 60 and I'm gonna get on the deep stuff here. Let's, let's get into the deep stuff. <laughs> okay, so from here, I'm just gonna mosh the throttle as hard as I can so we can see on the outside what the all wheel drive system does. Three, two, one, floor it. Oh yeah, it's controlling everything very nicely. It detects the slip and it's just being very slow and progressive at getting us up to speed. I mean, I'm up to 25 miles per hour right now and I've had my foot buried to the floor. <laughs> Let's see if we can uh, have some more fun here. Can I turn off traction control? Let's see, dynamic. So I'm gonna turn that off. We're gonna go to dynamic and I'm gonna go to sport. That should relieve one layer of traction control. Oh yeah, now I can spin tires. Whoa, <laughs> when it gets grip, it gets grip. <laughs> oh yeah, nice. And brakes, it's doing a really good job and it's actually not too invasive. You know, usually uh, when you slam the brakes on on snow, it's really loud and really aggressive. That actually was pretty good. It was subtle. I mean, again, it was kind of that luxury experience. Obviously this car is very low, so it is just scooping up the snow, but luckily this is really soft snow. Uh, so we don't have to worry about damaging it with big chunks of ice. Now it does have air suspension, but I seem to have no way of actually modifying the ride height. Um, it just kind of does it all automatically. Love those cameras, they are great. And even though this is a big car, I can turn around very quickly because of that rear wheel steering. Okay, now we're in sport mode so I can get this thing a little sideways. So now we're gonna try a full power launch in the snow in sport mode. Okay, three, two, 
One, go. Okay, power should be going to the back. It's slipping a little bit, but it's doing a really good job of controlling it. I am buried to the floor. Now I'm up to 30 miles an hour. <laughs> So it does a really good job of shifting that power around where it's needed. And the benefit of a system like this, where you have um, electric motor, electric motor, is the fact that it doesn't need to go through a drive line. It can modulate that power instantaneously, which really makes these type of vehicles the best all-wheel drive you can get. But of course, you have to be careful because this is a large vehicle and it has a lot of momentum. So if you do lose control, there's only so much the vehicle can do. So you always have to maintain a controlled speed at all times. I'm gonna to try to do a donut here. So to try to get a donut, I need to be able to turn off traction control completely if that is even possible. So there's an ESP menu. Uh, on, off. Oh, okay, well that was pretty straightforward. Um, I was able to turn it off just by hitting the car button and then ESP. So let's see if that actually turned it off and we can get a nice little donut here. Hopefully it's okay. Now, ooh, depth of the snow is a problem. Oh boy. Okay, we, ha we actually have a little bit of a snow depth issue here. Oh. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Can we do a donut? Yes, it will donut. <laughs> Actually, donut's really good. <laughs> I don't want to burn through all my battery. So we're going to jump back on the freeway and continue our journey to Cleelum. Now that I have 146 miles left on the battery. Okay, we're coming up on our exit here and it looks like we have 104 miles remaining, worst case scenario. Now, the system is estimating anything from 104 miles to 146 miles, depending on how I drive. Now. On the upside, the whole trip back is mostly downhill because we've gone up over a mountain pass. So that works to our advantage. Also, if we do get close to running out, we can always stop in North Bend, which is still about mm, 30 miles short of our office to get a charge there. And we might just have to do that. But it really underlines a potential issue with anybody looking for an EV. Even if you're looking at, you know, something that is well within the range of your vehicle, if you make any unplanned diversions, it can really you know, throw that range anxiety back into your day. You might have left totally fine, but like right now, not gonna lie, I am a little worried. But we're gonna go all the way downtown, flip it around and head back and see if this is uh, really doable for us today. So we've had a chance to flip around we grab some lunch and uh, we're heading back to Bellevue, Washington. Now the navigation system shows that we have 67 miles to go. And when we get there, we will have 17%. Now 17% is not a lot of leeway. Um, hopefully we can get there and not have to charge up again. However, along the way, I, have, I do know that there is a DC fast charger in North Bend that can get us the rest of the way if we need to. But it is a little weird still. I mean, Cleelum had no chargers that were appropriate for this vehicle. They did have a Tesla supercharger station, but that doesn't do us any good. So you really have to keep in mind where you're going, what the charging station situation is, and then plan accordingly. We're still pretty early in the whole EV switchover, so I'm not, I'm not condemning it by saying that the charging stations are like impossible to find, but you do need a plan and you have to hope that the stations will be functional when you get there. So we have about 30 more miles to get to Bellevue, Washington. I'm noticing that on the nav system, it's been keeping pretty consistent at that 17% remaining when we get to where we're going. So I'm gonna risk it and I'm just gonna push all the way to Bellevue and we'll see um, how accurate that is. Uh, I am showing that I have 63 miles on my range, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of where I start to get a little bit nervous, but I think we'll be okay today. So if I wanted to, um, there is a way here to be able to look for charging stations along the way. So if I actually was in a severe panic, 
I just click that, I do along the route, and you can see that there's all sorts of different locations between here and Bellevue. But we're gonna go ahead and skip those today. I don't think I need those. So we're just gonna cross our fingers and risk it. So if you are considering a luxury electric, I think that the EQS maybe isn't one of my favorites. And even though it has a lot of good ideas happening, there's a lot of things where I just ask, why? Why can't the passenger use applications? Why, when I hit little buttons on the steering wheel, does sometimes it hit the adjacent button? It doesn't always hit the right button. And why does this sound system just not sound very good? I mean, it's a Burmeister. You expect it to be good, but it's like, eh, at the best. So there's just a lot. Oh, oh, and then the looks. <laughs> Can we talk about the looks? I've had people comment saying, hey, is that a Chrysler 300? Or, hey, is that a new Buick? These are not things you want to hear if you're spending 120 grand or more on a Mercedes. So I think that Mercedes has some good ideas here. I think going forward, they need to really focus and, and produce a more polished product uh, because this particular car just really isn't doing it for me. On the upside, the powertrain is really good. As you can see in the snow, it's both really good about shifting power around when you need it and reducing wheel spin on slippery surfaces. However, if you want to turn off traction control, it lets you do a full donut, and that is great. So hopefully more of this powertrain and less of all this. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share videos. We make them for you, and I hope you enjoy.